We currently have with us Rita McGrath, who is uh, in New York. We have Scott Anthony, who is currently in Singapore. And we have Tanai Viki, who is, of all the places in the world, in Omaha. <laughs> and myself, Chris, which are currently based in the office in, in Norway. Uh, we also have a large number of people uh, just connecting, dialing in from all over the world. And as you will see, uh, there will be plenty of room for questions and discussions as we, uh, as we proceed. So welcome, everyone. And if you have any questions either during or towards the end of the se seminar, just, just make sure to type it in the Q&A section. Then Adelina, who will uh, manage the, the technology in the back end, will make sure that all the questions get answered. And we might take some questions during the webinar, uh, but we will make sure to take every question towards the end of, of the webinar. And there will be plenty of time for, for interactions with, with all of the speakers. And the speakers we have with us, um, we're very happy to see this, uh, this great team to come together. First of all, we had Rita McGrath of uh, Valais and of course, Columbia Business School. Hello, Rita. Hi. Morning, late evening, afternoon, whatever. <laughs> very, uh, very happy. And it was actually, uh, it was actually our conversation, or really your conversation back in December that initiated this, mm -hmm. uh, this webinar today. And we have, uh, we have Scott Anthony of, of InnoSight and InnoSight X based out of Singapore. Good, uh, good evening, Scott. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning. Very happy to be here, Chris. Very happy to have you. And then, Tanai Hiki uh, of, uh, of Strategizer, a uh, very impressive uh, author, speaker, and, and I keep hearing um, uh, you know, really amazing things about you. So Tanai, I'm very happy that you uh, could join us for, for this webinar. Yeah, thank you for having me, Christian. I'm having a lot of fun in Omaha. <laughs> and, you know, can, can we inquire, why would you possibly want to go to Omaha on a fine day like this? Yeah, I have a gig with TD Ameritrade. They're kind of big over here, so. Yeah, I'm doing some consulting work with them, so that's why I'm out here. Good for you. Good for you. Not Warren Buffett, huh? Sorry, Rita? Not Warren Buffett. Yeah, no, unfortunately not. I wish you were Warren Buffett. <laughs> Maybe you need some innovation platform advice. Right. <laughs> so let me do a brief introduction to the topic today. And um, as, as most of you know, we are, uh, we're titled this webinar, uh, Rise of the Strategy Platforms. And our purpose today is really to create a conversation to explore this topic and, and, and surrounding topics. Uh, and I, and also in the previous conversations we've, we've had internally, uh, we find this to be a very interesting, um, quite a big uh, topic to explore with a lot of things happening. And, and those two things are primarily driven by the rise of, of digital platforms as a whole. And also the, the this pretty significant changes that we see in the, in the field of strategy. And, and I think that during the conversation today, we will sort of see those two trends converge. Uh, and it'd be very interesting to explore this topic from, from at least four different angles, partially different, partially very similar. And we'll see where that conversation takes us. And it's, it's fascinating, and I trust most of you that are, are dialing in today uh, have some knowledge of and maybe even background within the, the platform economy. And, and today we, we see a lot of media, we see a lot of press, we see a lot of attention around the, the platform economy, but it has been around uh, for some time. Uh, and it, once you start going back, you'll find a number of, of sources and papers and research of this phenomenon that is only maybe now beginning to be fully understood, if even. There's a number of, of great books and, and over the last, say, 12 months or so, we've seen an even, even larger number of books come out on the platform economy and what it means with the Ubers and the Airbnbs and the likes. We've also seen, this is, this is very fascinating and be very happy to hear from the speakers uh, what your thoughts are. We're seeing very customized, very specific platform innovation toolkits. And there's a number of different developers and different designers and different strategists within this space that have really dug in to, to develop uh, tools for platform-based economy, as opposed to other, uh, let's call it previously types of economies. And I've, I've personally used many of these tools in, in sessions and, and, and in keynotes, and very powerful and quite different from other 
tools that are currently uh, available. So there's a lot of things happening in the, the platform economy space. And, and many of you probably know this from the rise of these technology companies. And there are a lot of rankings, this one by Visual Capitalist, that show us by, by 2016, the largest companies by market cap were all Apple, Alphabet, Microsoft, Amazon, Facebook. They're all, to a certain degree, platform-based business models. So we have the, the platform economy that is growing significantly. But then, Scott, we also have some changes that are happening in the space and have been happening in the space of, of strategy over the last couple of years. Yes, thank you very much, Chris. And I think it is really interesting to see the intersection between the two topics that you talked about at the beginning, the platforms and the business models. I don't know if many people know this, but Insight, which today is a strategy consulting company, has its origins in platforms. So when it was founded by Clayton Christensen and my colleague Mark Johnson back in 2000, the original idea was to create an online platform that could democratize the concept of disruptive innovation and bring it to a broader population. It turned out the fundamental technology wasn't quite ready, so we got into consulting and that has been the backbone of the business. But you see a few years ago, Clay wrote this article describing some of the disruptive changes happening in the industry. And if you go to the next slide, you can see that this has only continued as you have the rise of things like artificial intelligence, along with the platform changes that you described, and then some of the new business models that we're beginning to see emerge, there is the potential that there could be real transformative change in an industry that honestly has been stable for decades. You know, there of course are competitive shifts in the industry, but I think we're all beginning to see something quite profound, going back to where you started on the next slide perhaps, as you bring together the themes that you talked about at the very beginning where you say, as we get the platforms, the technology, combining with strategy, and then new business models, you have things that really could lead to substantial industry change. And I'm interested to learn from all the people participating tonight, the specific things they're doing. And of course, our audience here, some of the changes they're seeing taking place, how they're using new platforms and so on. So I think we're primed to have a really great discussion. And I think we can actually get started right away. We've got uh, Rita McGrath here. You mentioned her before. Uh, I've had the privilege uh, of collaborating with Rita in one form or another for, gosh, almost 15 years now. She wow. was kind enough to send me an advanced copy of her latest book, which I absolutely insist everybody here get a copy of when it comes out. It is a fantastic read. So I, I'm, Rita, it's surprising giving you the honor of the introduction. Rita, we're going to turn it over to you to have you Tell us a little bit of your latest research and then how you're making it real with your own platform. Great. So Rita, take it away. Okay, so uh, that's the introduction. Um, and so I've uh, started a sister company to the, my own one, which is called Belize. And the idea behind it is to help um, create tools that people can use to actually do the innovation work themselves and really um, um, you know, institutionalize a lot of these frameworks. Because what happens is, you know, you'll go to a course that Scott teaches or I teach or whatever, and you come back to your company and now you've got to like come up with how you're actually going to make this real. So it's not just enough to, I think, understand the concepts. It's how do you now actually make it work within your organization. So if we could have the next slide. So the basic idea here is, is to dig a little bit into why strategy isn't what it used to be in the next one. Um, so if you think about uh, the concept of strategy, right, it, it really gained a lot of force, I'd say in the 60s and 70s when the big consulting firms got started and people started to say, hey, wait a minute, there's an, a set of analytical tools that we can use to think about the world of strategy. So if you go next. And, you know, the, the basic concepts were that you could actually predict some of the way the world was going to work by using um, analytical approaches. And uh, the, the Walter Kieschel, who's a former uh, editor of Business Week, wrote this terrific book called The Lords of Strategy and how this idea became uh, so important. So I'll take one of the ideas that became very popular, which was the, uh, the idea of the learning curve. And what researchers found was that if you look at units produced over time 
and map that against the cumulative number of units produced, that you had a predictable decrease in cost. And this led to the next slide, which is the BCG, um, very famous matrix. You know, there was a study that said, but basically 80% of all American executives had a copy of this in their desk drawers. Um, but basically the logic was, if you could find a rapidly growing industry and get yourself into a powerful position in that industry, you would make more units than other people playing in that industry and therefore you would have a, a cost advantage. And if you preserve that for a long time, that would give you the ability to stay ahead of the competition. And that in turn led to this very famous two by two, which said if you look at market growth rate as opposed to market share, uh, that gave you some strategic choices that you could make and some strategic advice. So if you were in a high growth rate situation and had a large share, that was the ideal, right? You were gonna get ahead of everybody else and that was gonna give you an advantage. If the growth rate was slow, but you had a big share, that was okay too, because that was your cash cow. And then the other dimension was a little bit more um, uh, concerning, which is if it was a low growth rate, you had a small share, they called those dogs, they said divest those, and they never did figure out what to do with the question marks, which was high growth rate, but you're in a low share situation. Um, so my point about this, this grid is there, you know, it was very influential. It drove a lot of decision making. Um, for example, American companies completely got out of the television business, as an example. Um, and yet there were flaws in it, right, that, that only came to light a bit later. So if you can take the next slide. Um, so what ended up happening was a lot of these um, um, models were uh, based on the idea of industry. And if you think about um, um, strategy, right, a lot of academic strategy work came from industrial economics and a lot of great tools, but they were really looking just at industries. And part of the problem was a lot of these models really don't apply when you look at today's environment where digital and many other things have made the whole concept of industry much less robust than perhaps it used to be. So we go to the next one. Um, so what I've argued, and, uh, and BCG was very kind, they actually gave me a, a slice in their history of strategy, um, is that what we need to be better at is something I call transient advantage, which is the idea that your advantage emerges, uh, that's the innovation process, you have a period of time during which you get to exploit it, and then it goes into uh, decline. And one of the core arguments I make is that leaders need to be better at managing every piece of that life cycle of a competitive advantage. So you the next one. Um, and so essentially what, what the world looks like is more like this, right? So this is a picture of competitive advantages represented by market share in the gaming business. So in the beginning, you had arcade games and that was all there was. You know, you had to go to a physical place and throw money at this refrigerator sized um, uh, machine and the machine and the game were built together. You know, you didn't have a separate gaming sort of platform and that wasn't very convenient. So then that gave way to games that could be played on devices you had at home. And that was cool. Um, and we, somewhere around there, we started to see the separation of the software part of games from the actual mechanics of games. Um, and then as we moved on, we started to see uh, the, um, the, the, the emergence of games that could be played on general purpose devices. And of course, now we have games that are played on the web, games that are played on social media, games that are played on phones. Um, and so what I think is important here is this pattern. You have this emergence of a competitive advantage, a period of exploitation, which is awesome, and then, and then a period of decline. And so one of the things I think that this new set of strategy tools needs to be helping people to do is deal with all of those life cycle phases. So we get up the next one. Um, so what I talk about is a concept that I call arenas rather than industries. So how do we think about competing in a world where industry is maybe not the most important boundary condition that you're dealing with? And I love this study. It was done um, by the Wall Street Journal, and they were looking at the impact of modern smartphones on um, people spending, on household spending. And what they found was spending on things like household textiles and women's apparel was way down uh, over the period from 2007 to 2013. So the period, you know, so in a few years after the introduction of smartphones and spending on cellular phones and home internet up by double digits during that same period. 
And so if you don't understand this, like if you're making apparel or clothing and you're comparing yourself to other people that make apparel and you're benchmarking, that's great. But that's not really going to tell you very much about what your competitive dynamics are going to represent. So we could have the next slide. Uh, instead, what you want to be doing is thinking about the whole pot of resources that you're um, addressing and then how, you know, how you can be the dominant person. And, and I love um, Clay Christensen's argument about jobs to be done, right? And his essential argument is you don't, you don't want to think about products that you buy. You want to think about things you're spending your money on that help you get jobs done in your own life. And that really then leads to uh, platforms. So what we're working on is at Belize is a set of uh, tools. And this is an example of what some of them look like. So, you know, from diagnostics, we've got some screening scorecards. We're working on an opportunity portfolio matrix, um, which is pretty soon ready to show to the public, which will be nice. Um, but we're taking a lot of the tools that come out of uh, the work that I've been doing for years. And the idea is that it would be more of a process of you come to a seminar like this, or you go to a webinar, or you go to a course, you get the concept, but then these tools will make it really easy and faster to implement when you get, you know, when you actually get back at the office and have to make them work. And I'm seeing a lot of appetite for that. And so I think Christian, going back to your argument, which is rather than hiring a consultant or hiring somebody to do this for you, wouldn't it be great if you had some automated digital way of doing that for yourself? Mm -hmm. So that's really what we're working on. Uh, and this is the first batch of them that, that we're uh, trying to basically instrument. So, um, so I guess that, that's the context in which uh, I'm working at the moment. So I'll turn it back over to you guys. Thank you, uh, Rita. And, and just to sort of cl close out what you were saying, uh, what do you think, Scott? We should definitely, uh, Scott, Scott, maybe you want to give, uh, you know, a sneak preview, just, you know, a few lines about the book? A sneak preview of Rita's book. Well, Rita was nice enough to ask me for an endorsement, so I'll be writing the endorsement as I speak and see what words come out of my mouth. But, you know, like, like everything that Rita has written, there is just this fantastic combination of things that really stretch your brain, thinking about arenas versus thinking about industries, the idea of snow melting at the edges, so we have to see the periphery if we're going to understand how things will change, new leadership models we need to follow, and so on. So great mind-stretching concepts grounded in practicality that you can put to use immediately with some really interesting case studies as well, some that no one has ever read about before. So it's a really good book. I highly recommend it. Thanks, Scott. One of my all-time favorites is this German metal distribution company called Klockner, which nobody's ever heard about. And they have managed the most phenomenal digital transformation. It's incredible what they've done. So yeah, it's nice to, nice to be able to talk about them a bit. If, I, if my memory is correct, that case study had the, the line in the book on page 155 or thereabouts that I, I circled and read three times where the company was talking about all the barriers that were holding them back when it comes to innovation and they had this long list. And then the penny dropped in that everything that was on the list was a self-imposed constraint. Okay. So it wasn't that there was some force from the outside that made it impossible. They, their biggest enemy looked them in the mirror every day. I thought it was a, a great example. Thanks. I think you. I think you definitely uh, got everyone's attention on that. Thank you, Scott. That was uh, that was very nice. And I think also, uh, Rita, if I can just ask you, uh, you know, this is a this is a quote that you've been using. And I think it's a really important one. So the the thing about traditional planning, and I've been talking about this for probably twenty years, thirty years, maybe, um, is that when we plan for new businesses, the way that we plan for existing ones we assume a lot more knowledge than we actually have. And so what I see happening is people will put together this beautiful PowerPoint with lots of spreadsheets in the back and it's all great. And they go to the committee that has the money um, and they get all the money, right? And they get a staff of 15 and they, you know, build this sort of massive project and off they go off they go and yet they don't really know right so what ends up happening is six months out you sort of looking around going oh well that didn't work out the way that i thought or this wasn't shaped the way that i expected bah, 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 bah. and then what ends up happening is you know when it is time to the fancy word today is pivot 
right? You've now got a big expensive project rather than the alternative, which <laughs> both the folks, everybody on this, this call is, is endorsing, which is try something small, try an experiment, spend a little bit of money to learn and learn your way into what that business actually has to be rather than thinking that you know everything as you start. So the idea is to make a small amount of resource available for experimentation rather than a huge commitment to a given course of action right from the get-go. Hmm. Tenai, maybe I can, I, I can do a quick sort of follow-up question on, on that. So, so this, this concept that Rita is, uh, uh, is discussing is something I, I know strategizers are very passionate about. Um, what's your perspective on, on the importance of experimentation? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that happens, I mean, exactly what, what Rita is talking about. I mean, when you not only do companies invest too much money early on before they understand whether the ventures are going to be successful or not, but also when you make big bets, what you do is you constrain the company's opportunity to try many more things. And what we know is that you can't pick the winners from day one. And so if you can't pick the winners from day one, you have to be making multiple small bets and then testing what works versus what doesn't work. So if the ventures get big before they get smart, not only are they likely to fail, they're also likely to consume resources away from other things that you could be testing and learning about. And so we believe that this is a really big problem for sure. Wonderful, thank you, thank you. So if you're interested in, in learning more about the Valais uh, and the platform and, and the quite a, a impressive uh, software development Rita and her team are, are doing, keep your eyes on, on Valais and stay tuned to some of the things that will be coming, right Rita? Absolutely. Absolutely, thank you, thank you. Now I'd like to do, um, to just very briefly introduce our, our second uh, speaker today. Um, he is probably one of the most prolific writers in any space uh, in, in the world of business. And he's definitely uh, one of the absolutely most prolific writers in the space of strategy and, and innovation. And I've, I've followed Scott's writing since, I don't know when you started writing Scott, but you've been, you've been at this for maybe 15 years, yeah? Yeah, uh, first, first thing that appeared anywhere was probably in 2000 and late 2003. So a little bit more than 15 years now, yep. And uh, it's, it's, it's really been uh, you know, a, a pleasure to follow the evolution. And it's also interesting to see uh, InnoSight, which is a, which is a, uh, a US-based company, uh, expand and, and, and they get up setting up shop um, very nicely aligned in, in Singapore, where Scott is now the, uh, the managing director and leading, if, uh, if my memory serves me, the, the Asian, uh, Asian Pacific work at, at InnoSight. But Scott, you... Um, you guys are a hundred, hundred and ten plus company, and then you decided to let's let's take a few more steps. Innocent X. Yes, absolutely. So Innocent X brings us back to our roots. So I, I mentioned at the very beginning that when Innocent was founded, and I should be clear, I was not part of the founding team. It was Clayton Christensen from the Harvard Business School and my colleague Mark Johnson. I joined three years after they founded the shop. The intent was to create a platform. And I think a lot of the original ideas that Clay and Mark had were spot on, but the world wasn't quite ready for it. So it took us 15 years of in the field consulting, doing hands-on work with the great big companies around the globe to come back to our roots and say, maybe things have changed enough that we ought to take another go at democratizing some of the core concepts that we use in our strategy consulting work and use technology with some business model innovation to bring them to a broader population of users. And that is Innosight X, the platform that you see pictured on the screen here. Chris, if you actually go forward, I think you can skip the next page. I think that's a holding slide. If you go one more forward, great. I'll tell you a little bit about Innosight first, because I think that helps set the foundation for the specific things we're trying to do with Innosight X. So you see our mission statement on the right side of the page. We empower forward-thinking organizations to navigate disruptive change and own the future. Let me parse the words in that because each of them are quite important. Empower. When we work with clients, it isn't just giving them an answer. It's giving them a way to think, a way to frame a problem, giving them muscle so they can do it on their own. Forward-thinking. We deal exclusively with problems of the future. We're not a consulting company that helps you get a couple extra basis points in your core operations. There are many others who do that well. We're all about what are we going to do next and how are we going to do it? Mm -hmm. Navigate. 
it's never a straight line. There are always twists and turns and false starts and fumbles and even failures along the way. Recognizing it's a journey and having a guide to that journey, we view as absolutely critical. Disruptive change, of course, goes to our heritage. Interestingly, 1995 was the year that Rita co-authored an article on discovery-driven planning in the Harvard Business Review, and Clay had one of his first mass market articles on disruptive change. So that was a pretty big year in the field of strategy and innovation. And of course, disruptive change used to be something that affected technology industries, but now really is affecting every industry all around the globe. Finally, own the future. The clients we work with aren't interested in getting a little better. They're really interested in what are we going to be next and how do we actually go and make that happen. You can see just a few sample logos beneath this. I think the thing to call out from the logos here, none of these companies are small. None of these companies are startups. Historically, Insight's core clients have been large, reasonably successful companies that see disruptive change coming and want to stay large, reasonably successful companies. <laughs> if you click one more time, you'll then see some of the, the foundations behind our work. So these are, are things that members of, of our leadership team have written. We try to find the best ideas wherever they might be. We tell everyone to read books like all of Rita McGrath's books. We tell people to go look at value proposition design, go and, and look at other books like that. Get the best tools that you can out there and then go work side by side with clients to turn them into reality. And of course, we've been thrilled with how this has worked, getting any professional services company up to more than 100 people takes some hard work and a lot of luck. But Chris, if you go to the next slide, we're not satisfied because again, the business model in traditional strategy consulting really consigns you to work with the sorts of companies that you saw on the last page. Companies, of course, that we love working with, we love guiding, we love advising, but we know that there are thousands, if not tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of companies that could benefit with help in confronting the challenges of disruptive change. So the idea that we've been working on for about 18 months now is this idea in a site X. The basic idea is you take the work that we do in the field and you break it into these things that we call growth sprints. You see the four ones we're leading with in the left column here, discover, experiment, culture, and strategy. Mm -hmm. The platform then gives you a combination. There are lots of tools and videos and templates and tips that exist on the platform. It's also got step-by-step -step guides to help you go through each of these areas. And then critically, you've got access to growth experts who can guide you through the process of taking all of these tools and applying them to your particular circumstance. So it's very much viewed as a hybrid model where yes, we've got lots of tools, templates, and tips, but we also have experts that can guide you through the journey. Now, the experts are going to be working remotely over the platform. They're going to be giving you guidance maybe once a week or once every two weeks, depending on what you're trying to do. So it is a very different model than the traditional strategy consulting model, much more a do-it-yourself model, but something where you do have trusted hands that can help you through the process and a really great online platform that can make it all real. So then that, the next slide. And the final slide of the overview of Insight X. In the interest, again, of democratizing some of our ideas, one approach is to go direct to the clients and say, all right, let's work with you, company X, to help you empower your leading, to help you, to empower you, sorry, to navigate disruptive change and know in the future. Another approach is to work with all the organizations around the globe that are working in their individual markets with their local clients and say, can we essentially create force multipliers where we can find boutique consultancies out there and essentially infuse them with some of this IP where the consultancies that we work with get access to the platform, get advice from a community that we hope grows over time, and of course gets access to all the behind the scenes material so not only can they work with people on the platform, but they can provide better advice to the people they're working with in their local markets. I'm really excited about the direct model. I'm also really excited about this model forever. We have had people who have contacted us who have said, can I be your representative in Geography X? And our answer historically has been, we would love to do that, but we're really focused on expanding in our current geographic markets. But with now the online tool, with the platform that we have built, 
this model now becomes possible. We're still working out some of the specific details here, which is why it says coming soon. But I think it's another thing that's going to allow us to ultimately expand our reach, deepen our impact, and reach a much broader population of clients, all in the name of disruptive innovation. So that's the basic overview of NSIDX. And look forward, Chris, if you've got questions, taking them from you, and of course, getting things from the audience as well as we continue to go through our discussion. Uh, that's, uh, that's wonderful, Scott. And we're getting a lot of questions and comments, and we're sort of storing them for, for later. But I want to ask you one question. Um, so you launched Innocent X maybe eight months ago? Yeah, well, eight months ago is kind of the prototype version of Innocite X. So yes, the, the, there was an email that went out that said Innocite X was available. We had really the, the functional prototype of the platform earlier this year, and something that really is getting close to commercial grade now. You know, we're following the advice that we give people, trying to hustle and, and all that. <laughs> so I'm, uh, you know, basically you're following, you know, the uh, the start small and build. Uh, su suggestion, but I'm, I'm curious. What have, what have, what has been some of the learnings and adjustments that you have been doing while you've been running the, the early beta version? Yeah, uh, Chris, that's a great question. And of course, we have built a discovery-driven plan. We have a business model canvas. There's a reverse income statement. We've looked at the jobs to be done. We have to be careful not spending too much time doing our own stuff on our idea. <laughs> but we've done all those things. But let me tell you one thing that I think has been interesting. You know, one of, of the theories that we had at the very beginning is that we were going after what you would call non-consumption in that there was a big population of customers out there that didn't have access to anything. So the best they could really do is buy a book and try and do the best they could with the book. We realized that just isn't true. That There actually are a lot of things out there on the online side and of course on the physical side as well. There are tens of thousands of small consultancies that will work with people in local areas. There are academics, business school, professors in every corner of the globe that can coach people as they're dealing with some of these challenges. So we would like to believe that these, these solutions each have their own imperfections and there's ways that we can solve the problem better. But because of this learning, the idea that you see on the screen here has really risen up in prominence. The more you recognize there are lots of people out there, the more you say, well, why compete with them? Why don't you help them do what they're trying to do better with the clients that they're working with. But that was something that we didn't expect in the beginning and has led to some changes in the business model. Great, uh, again, thank you. And I think we, uh, we're gonna get a lot of questions a little bit later when we get to the, the questions section. Um, thank you very much, Scott. <laughs> for uh, for our, next, uh, our next speaker, um, he's a very, uh, very well acclaimed author. Um, Definitely recommend his uh, his readings. And he re recently joined uh, Strategizer as an uh, associate partner and resides in London, but mostly lives on airplane as, as far as I've understood. So uh, Tanai, welcome and thank you for joining. Yeah, thank you for having me. Thank you very much. Yeah, no, I'm really excited to have become part of Strategizer. I've been looking up to Alex Osterwald as a mentor for a long time. So spending time with him and Yves Pignor, just learning from them has been a, quite an awesome experience for me for the last half a year. So it's been good. Excellent. All right. So let's talk a little bit about Strategizer and the work we do at Strategizer. The most famous product coming out of Strategizer is, of course, the business model canvas. I even heard Scott make mention of it. And, you know, everybody knows the business model canvas, which was the notion that, you know, people should be thinking about the, their business model and value propositions beyond just the product or technologies that they're working on. And so, I mean, that was, that, that's a very powerful concept and principle, but another powerful concept and principle that comes from Strategizer is the notion of how people come to manifest this style of thinking. And we strongly believe in visual tools that are very clear, simple, and practical. Mm -hmm. So that beyond just sort of learning about the concepts, you can also have tools that then allow you to embody the practice and, and, in, in, and in, in, in embodying the practice, you're able to actually do the work. But what was also interesting for us is that we really believe that there's still work to be done. And I love Rita's presentation, which talks about, you know, the, vari the various life cycles of a product. There's still conversations that we support, we're, we're having with companies around becoming more ambidextrous. Because we really believe that, you know, every product has a life cycle. And when companies find a successful business model, they then redesign their whole company to align itself with that business model. And so when they do that, what they've done is they've effectively coupled together the life cycle of their company 
in the life cycle of their product and, and business model. And we believe that leadership in the 21st century is about uncoupling your company from the, the life cycle of your company, from the life cycle of the product that you're making. And so we really pay a lot of attention in, in having conversations with leaders and also trying to make sure that we're sort of building knowledge. And we still believe there's a lot of teaching work and a lot of writing, you know, to, to actually be done. And so um, if you can go to the next slide. So, you know, we believe that, you know, companies should have a balanced portfolio, you know, that balances exploitation of current business models and exploration of, of new business models. This is a new tool that, you know, um, Alex has been kind of working on. It's called the business portfolio map. And it's really useful for us when we're workshopping with, with, um, with, with companies in terms of helping them see exactly what their portfolio looks like. Mm -hmm. And when they actually see it visually, most of them gasp. I've heard like loud gasps when they see the, you know, all, the, all the sticky notes so sort of proliferating at the top there in the ex ex exploit portfolio. Um, if you then move on to the next slide. But then part of what we believe as well is that like, as we help companies think, we actually really think that the best way to work is to use visual inquiry tools or, or visual tools. So you can see there the business model canvas, value proposition canvas, culture map, progress board, business environment canvas. Because what this allows us to do is to help people think about um, you know, strategy and business model as, as design, design and, 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 and testing. And if you think about these, the, these processes at, at design, it, it allows you to start thinking about even those things that are happening at the edges and how it, it might actually impact your, 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 your organization. And if, you, and if you click forward to the next slide, you'll see the statement here that says, you know, we believe that you know, visual tools help teams address wicked problems, you know, the kind of problems that you can't plan your way through, the kind of problems that you can't write a business plan through. And we believe that strategy is one of these sorts of wicked problems that needs a sort of a, a, a specific form of tools to, to kind of work through. And that's why we, 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 we kind of, you know, love the use of visual tools. And what's interesting about the conversation we're having today is that like as the, you know, the platforms and technologies have advanced, it really presents a unique opportunity to combine this style of working or this way of thinking with technology and platforms to help teams, you know, collaborate even, you know, asynchronously or, or remotely, right, using, you know, online platforms. So if you can move forward. And so, you know, the way strategizer is set up, and these slides have got this like, you know, we, it, it's like magic the way they kind of, you know, <laughs> blend together. There. But the way strategizer is set up is that there's part of our work that's about coaching, training, and sort of educating. So we have the, we have the Cloud Academy, where we combine online micro learning, with engaging exercises and we facilitate this with expert coaches on the platform and we really focus on like the user experience and making sure that people are really experiencing you know a sort of a beautiful platform to to, to kind of work with and, and 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 if you click forward you can see some of the offerings that we have on the platform you know such as you know uh, you know lessons in uh, or you know areas of value proposition design business model generation prototyping and assessing and we're currently building a testing course as well you know take, teaching people how to test their ideas again to help people really bring to life that principle that Rita was, was, was talking about you know get smart before you get big and so how do you actually do that you know what are what are the tools that you use how do you define your assumptions how do you test your assumptions how do you you know have the right metrics how, you know how to use all that and in addition to this we also work with organizations we have two products one called spark and another one called um, uh, the innovation sprint where we work with organizations to start coaching them to actually how to do the practice of testing their idea that they move from idea to sort of launch right and then in addition to that we're also building and if you can move forward to the to the next slide we're also building a platform where teams can actually use the, you know you know the, the strategy the tools the business model the business model canvas value proposition canvas and testing ideas and what we're trying to do is we're trying to combine these visual inquiry tools with software to facilitate collaboration right and so it, you know it, it's pretty exciting what you know the, the the kind of pace of technology development now and you know is actually enabling us to, to do and so we you know we, we find it exciting that we can use these these, these platforms you know to, to to kind of help teams work together um if you can move to the next slide and now I'll, I'll kind of bring this to a close so you can see here that you know the, the tools can be used to design a value proposition. That's our visual, you know, our our, our 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 online platform. And if you click forward, you'll see that the tools can also be used to design your business model, 
right? So you can, you know, move from value proposition to business model. These are sort of screenshots from the, from the, from the platform. And then finally, the tool can also be used to test your, 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 your value proposition, you know, design your experiments, track your experiments, and kind of see how, how, how you're moving forward. And we believe that, this, you know, this combination of tools allows us to go from, you know, generating ideas to testing ideas and, and sort of seeing what works, but also using the, the online platform to evolve these ideas. So it's, you know, it's, it's a real sort of fundamental product that we're trying to build or fundamental experience that we're trying to build, you know, for the organizations that, that we work with. And then if you move forward, I think that's my last slide. And so really for us, we believe that, you know, there is a, there's a mindset or a, a, a philosophy or a paradigm shift in terms of how we do strategy rather than strategy as, 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 as execution, strategy becomes more about seeing around corners, right? Building, you know, you know building yourself for, 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 for transient advantages. Mm -hmm. And so in that way of working, we believe that taking a design mentality where you use visual tools, combining that with technology, and then this perspective of, you know, strategy as continuous reinvention, like that sweet spot, that's where strategizer really sits. And we're really trying to help companies sort of work through that in everything that we really do, so. I don't think I have anything else to say, but uh, thank you for having us on. Well, on, on, on the contrary, then, I, I think you have a lot of stuff to say as, as we proceed. And I'll, I'll just take one question right now. Um, what, what are some of the things that, that you would like to see, uh, you know, with the background that you have and, and the books you've been writing? What are some of the things that you would like to see uh, on Strategize or maybe moving a few years ahead? Yeah, so I mean, so mo so moving a few years ahead, well, you know, it's it's this combination of like, you know, it's sort of facilitating collaboration between teams, right? As the technology gets better and better, to you know, to be able to to, to do that, but also something similar to what Scott is describing with Inside X, you know, this 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 ability to, to connect coaches and and thinkers together with with uh, with uh, with with businesses and, and leaders in order to drive this thinking and this practice more and more. So, you know, the, the, you know, that's some of what we're thinking of doing is sort of working together to sort of, and that's why I also like this idea that, you know, you can have me on and you can Ritter on and you can have Scott on so that we can all start thinking about how we evolve these things together and how we work collaboratively to drive these changes that we're trying to drive. Yeah. Oh, wonderful, thank you. And uh, this is, it's, it's really uh, impressive. It's a great, great overview. Um, yeah, and check out our upcoming book, The Invincible Company, uh, currently in uh, preparation, it sort of combines all these concepts together in terms of how you can build invincible companies. Can I ask, do you have a launch date yet? Like roughly? Um, um, it's going to be early, I think, early 2020. Okay. Like very early 2020. We don't know exactly when, but yeah. Great. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. And uh, we'll, we'll come back to, uh, to you and Scott in a few, uh, in a few minutes. Um, so I'll, I'll uh, briefly introduce uh, the work that we've been doing on, on strategy tools. And some of you might know it, but we, we launched the beta version. So just like you, Scott, as eight months ago, we, we launched a very, very early um, beta version. And it's really the, uh, the um, so far, the end result of about 15 years uh, of work. And it was just interesting, Tana, when you were speaking, because I was uh, reflecting back to uh, three books that I wrote with some colleagues in Norway back in 2004, 2007. Uh, and these books were written in Norwegian, for Norwegians, by Norwegians, and we didn't have a website, uh, we didn't have a Twitter account, we uh, didn't even have a designer. They looked horrible, um, but content-wise, they were pretty decent. Um, and when I look back at them, what we did was basically put our toes in the water, so to speak, in terms of, of the visual tools and the visual uh, language, but without having any frame of reference, without having any network and, and sort of any community to, to learn from. But it was really back in, in, uh, in Copenhagen in, in 2010, where as I was reading uh, Konstantin Markita's books and, and also a number of others, that I realized that a lot of the, a lot of the strategy writing, as, as all of you know, is, is very text heavy. And, you know, you can only activate that much of, of people's brain capacity and, and creativity on, on very text heavy material. Um, and that really put us on a path of, of how, do we, how do we visualize this more? And, and right now, this is our latest sketch. This is from the, the middle of last year. 
So this is a very, very rough sketch um, where we sort of think uh, around, you know, strategy platform. And, and I think as, as you guys have, have, have also mentioned, you know, we're really looking to connect uh, non-consumers with, with suppliers. Uh, but I think we are really looking at this uh, from a technology point of view uh, as we're exploring this. And one of the things that have been maybe chasing me for the last year, year and a half, is, is, is this idea. And I know most of you are familiar with um, Mark Anderson's uh, Software is Eating the World piece back in 2011. And I think uh, having spoken with a large number of people in this field, including McKinsey Partners and, and the likes, there's a growing awareness uh, that, you know, in some kind of way, software is eating the world. And we don't know what that means quite and probably won't for, for a number of years. So, so where we are with strategy tools is that we have uh, completely developed 51 different strategy tools, canvases, split around seven different series. Uh, and we're now in the process of doing the guidebooks and the sort of the, the content and case studies for all, all 50 plus. Um, and there's particularly a lot, a lot of interest around the supercluster series that really look at the ecosystem level and the national innovation uh, level. And, and on the software, uh, we have the first six tools available in a free beta. Uh, and we have people running from Norway, Dubai, Asia, South America. And, and again, like, like you mentioned, Scott, um, as a beta, we're learning a lot and we're making continuous adjustments. Um, and equally, we've been really fortunate to, to get the interest from a large and, and rapidly glow, growing community um, of, of strategists around the world, from Hawaii to Dubai, from um, South Africa to, uh, to London. And, and there's a lot of people basically being a part of this conversation, uh, helping shape uh, the path forward. And, and the path forward, uh, this is probably called as non-technological as you can get it. Uh, this is what we call an accidental innovation. So late last year, I was, I was working with the um, Norwegian innovation clusters and we're trying to help them learn some new things. And out of that process came not one, not two, but three uh, effectively strategy simulators. And one of the things that we've been exploring is while building the technical platform and the digital platform and the digital universe, we're also putting a lot of energy into the physical learning and the physical space. And I think this picture is, is quite interesting. So what you're seeing here is a, a certification session in London about two weeks ago, where we had one of the participants being the facilitator, that's Ono with his white shirt and the back to the camera. But we have a lot of people here with a lot of experience, deeply concentrated uh, in trying to win this scale up simulation to build and scale a, a company to a, a certain valuation. And one of the things that I'm observing in the physical space is a lot of concentration, a lot of focus, a lot of relationship, uh, I call it collective learning, uh, as people dive into this material. And one of the questions that we have, and it's really an open-ended question, is how do we bring this level of learning and, and intensity from the physical space and onto the digital space so that the platforms that we build moving forward are even more, uh, let's call them human-centric than, than most platforms today. And those are questions that we have and we have far from, from answers. But interestingly enough, one of the things that take up most of our time right now is, is actually working with uh, deploying these, these strategy simulators where we combine the tools, the guidebooks, the software, and also the, the, the physical games themselves into a, into a complete solution. And, and we really try to bridge here the, the, the space between the physical world and the online world. And again, really just exploring where this might take us. But we're completely um, aligned around this and, and really trying to explore what might this mean for the next 20 to 30 years of, of strategy. And I think <clears throat> With that, with that background, we're going to sort of shift mode a little bit, um, not too much. I want to, I want to start with a question to, uh, to Scott and, uh, and Tendai, uh, and then we're going to do a few minutes of questions, and then Rita, we're going to bring you into the conversation as well. 
and then shortly we'll be opening up for questions from from the audience so gentlemen let me let me start with this question um, so we're talking about platforms from two perspectives so one is platform for connecting people and Nokia I'm sorry for taking that so you have effectively have a non-consuming buyer and you have an expert and you use the platform to connect people yeah while the other is more of the technology let's call it the tech where we can use big data advanced analytics um, machine learning to effectively build smarter strategy solutions so gentlemen what, what are your perspectives on, on that the connecting people versus the deep technology and scott maybe you want to start out first yeah, well, you know, it, it, one of the, the slides, uh, slide 13, I think, had the, the CB Insights report that talked about some of the fundamental changes going on in consulting. And it said, basically, there are four stacks in the consulting market. There's basic information, there's expertise, there's insight, and there's execution. And as you look at those different stacks, things like artificial intelligence, machine learning, big data, and so on, can help with the early stacks. You know, if you really need to get this specific information or need to know who is the person who knows the most, and increasingly then with the, some of the more detailed insight, they can help with pieces of that. Then as you think about getting things done, building alignment in a group, actually going and making it happen in a complex environment, getting an insight that might require combinatorial skills, that's where humans, are, I think, are always going to be required. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the things to always look at is the context and where are different tools going to be the right answer. I think, again, no doubt that you're going to have algorithms and, uh, and artificial intelligence taking a lot of the basic stuff that consultants used to do and do that a lot faster and a lot cheaper. Mm -hmm. Some of the more complex stuff that also involves working through human dynamics, uh, humans are still going to be needed for human dynamics for, the long, for a long time. So I think point one, you are gonna to continue to see developments on both sides of this. Of course, the smart people will use the AI and the big data analytics to allow the experts to provide even better advice. When you do those two things together, it's just like chess. You know, you combine Kasparov and Deep Blue together, it's a very powerful combination. Yeah, I love that. I love that last metaphor you just said there, the Kasparov and Deep Blue. You, you can't beat that combination, I think. I think really it's about thinking about, you know, where human beings add value and where, you know, machine learning and, and, and technology can, can actually add value. Right now, I mean, in the old consulting model, my, my brother's 21 years old, 22 years old, he worked for a large consulting firm. He turns up one day, he gets a big folder, and then he goes into an organization. And what, what, what the organization is paying them for is to, for him to do presentations on analytics and insights. And then he says, thank you very much. That's what I've learned about your organization. Here's what the market is doing. Over to you for execution. And then he leaves and, he, and then the company gets a big check, right? And so that stuff where companies are paying a lot of money to get that information for my 22-year-old brother working for a large global consulting firm, that stuff can definitely be made, you know, much more, you know, much cheaper and much more useful, you know, using AI and big data and, and all the technology stuff that's actually going on. Well, what's much more powerful is then thinking about how do you leverage these developments in technology to help human collaboration become better. And so not only, you know, about, you know, providing data and, 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 and providing insights, but also building our platforms to enable collaboration amongst people so that we can actually start to, to create value. And I think those are the elements that then become really powerful in terms of, you know, involving, you know, human beings in terms of like going from, from insights, deeper insights to, 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 to sort of execution. I've learned that, you know, working with organizations, you can really show them the stuff and they get it. And then when they get back to work, they get back to their habits. And that's the part where I think, you know, the human support and contact and coaching becomes really useful, you know, unless, unless you've got an AI bot or something that can remind you to test your assumptions, test your assumptions. But, you know, that's, it's probably easier done by a human being. Yeah. So a follow-up question to you, uh, well, initially you, Scott, as... So when we look at this field, you know, moving ahead, are we more likely to see consulting companies, the McKinsey's and the BCG's of the world, uh, start applying technology? Or do you think we will see uh, startups, let's call them uh, born strategy um, digitals, applying these things? What's your take on that? 
Uh, you know, if you just look at what's going on right now, all of the big consulting companies are making pretty big investments in some of the areas we've talked about, artificial intelligence, big data analytics, and so on. Yet, of course, they've got some parts of the innovator's dilemma, where if you're a big consulting company that's already consulting to everyone, you start looking at a business model that has very different price points, cost structures, and so on that could appear to be threatening to you, which is why I think as you look at the strategy platforms, most of them are coming either from startup companies or from places that look more like boutique consultancies, where it's just an easier thing to wrestle with because you're not already serving the entire world. Now, having said that, the, the big companies, uh, you, you mentioned some of them throw Accenture in the mix, EY, others, they're really smart companies that are used to being able to manage multiple practices, multiple delivery models, multiple business models inside. So I would certainly not discount them and being important players in the game. But of course, they, they've got more to lose if this really does go at a certain pace. So you'd expect some of the classic Christensen innovators dilemma behavior in some of them. Yeah, and what's really interesting for me, for you know, in terms of joining Strategizer in the, in the last year, I really got a feel for how Alex was really driving this, you know, this, this, this vision of the company as a platform company, right? Like, you know, make sure you design the right tools that have been able to be manifested in, as, as visual tools on a digital platform and, and, and building capabilities to actually do that inside the, the organization. And then sort of, you know, the, the evolution of the strategy of the business model is to then add the human beings to that, right? So we're almost like Amazon then opening bookstores. It's kind of, you, you know, you, you start from the technology and then, and then you start building in sort of the, the human element. So for me, the experience has, has been interesting because you don't see us, you know, suffer that sort of innovative dilemma in, in the same way that Scott is, is, is actually describing. And so we're sort of slowly building that up. And, and I think it's an exciting opportunity for smaller organizations to actually you know, start to, you know, disrupt the environment a little bit more. Mm -hmm. can I, Christian, can I weigh in on this? Of course you can. I think one of the big um, Achilles heels of the large consulting model is the insistence that they have leverage. So, you know, that, that, you know, you have one sort of senior talented person with a lot of expertise, and then you've got what Tendai referred to as the 22 year olds. And the way a lot of those companies make, make profits is that they basically leverage, you know, those, those worker bees. Um, and I think one of the things that technology has the potential to do is disrupt that model. So if you can use technology instead of 22 year olds, that gives you a very different way of looking at the world. Mm, absolutely. So uh, across, across all three of you, how, how do you see this, basically this conversation seeping into how we teach strategy? Interesting. Okay, so I mean, from so 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 there's an interesting combination of things going on for me here, right? Which is there's a bit of the philosophy, way of thinking, paradigm shift stuff that Rita and Scott have been talking about for years, right? Which is you know you manage for the future, you you just you manage for the future while you're running your core business, and how do you do that, and and, and how do you think about that? And then the question becomes, how does that manifest in the in, in the management tools that that we use to make these sorts of decisions and test these assumptions that we have about the future? And then finally, how does that then express itself in technology and platforms? And so I, I, I think for me, what's, what's, what's really important is, is to use technology to enable a way of working and thinking such mm -hmm. that when people use the technology, it's, it, it helps them seamlessly embody and, 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 and adapt the right way to, to actually do things. I think if we design our tools and, 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 and technologies in that way, they can become really powerful, even in the way that we teach strategy. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. The, the other observation I had just listening to this conversation and watching some of the tools that, that people have, I was really struck, Chris, by, by the simulation, the game that you had come up with. And I remember reading something years ago that said, you know, when a, a football team, an American football team is looking for its next coach, it shouldn't hire somebody who has been a coach in the college level, the professional level. They should have someone who's played John Madden's football or whatever 8 million times because they have experienced every possible circumstance. They've run every simulation. They know what they're supposed to do. So I think one of the other changes you'll see is we have rise of platforms and other tools is you will have people who will get to simulate, try and do different things as it comes to strategy and will therefore be much better strategists because they're not relying on a framework. The framework starts, the experiments teach, 
and then the experience really makes them good at something. I think that causes us to fundamentally rethink not just how we teach strategy, but how we teach really everything related to business and arguably many other fields. Oh, that's, that's, that's a great, uh, great comment, and I'll just chip in. So, so last week um, I was in I was in Copenhagen, and I um, I used the transform simulation, which is effectively a strategy and transformation for established companies. You gotta you gotta build and balance a business model portfolio. You have to build an innovation strategy. You have to deal with shocks. You have to see around corners and and deal with uh, the competition. And we 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 framed it in a on the afternoon, early evening of a two-day session. Um, took us about three hours, the way that we set it up. Uh, and it was incredible learning the following day during the debrief on what we call self-imposed strategic assumptions. Um, and, and, and some of the comments that people had were like, well, uh, the rules said we weren't allowed to do this. And, and we said, well, there were no rules. I mean, all the rules were basically in your head with, with all due respect. And as we transferred that onto the real life business, they, they made a number of reflections uh, in the direction of, you know, we have all of these self-imposed limitations and assumptions on our business model, on, on our competitive uh, landscape, and, and most, um, most entirely on what we are allowed to do as a company because we're so used to sticking to our core business and remaining there. So Rita, I want to bring this back to back to you. And you know, give, given this conversation, how, how can how can companies develop skills that you talk about in your book in, in actually seeing around corners? How, how do how do we learn that at scale? Well, I think the, um, the the place where it starts is what Scott alluded to earlier, uh, and I have a chapter in the book called "Snow Melts from the Edges." Um, and I think the first principle is you want to have your leaders present at the kind of edges of your organization. So, you know, where the customers are having exchanges, where the products are meeting actual usage and so forth. And I mean, Peter Drucker said years ago that the customer seldom is buying what you think you're selling him. <laughs> and I've always thought that was very profound. So I think the, the first principle I would say is, is have you got exposure to where the phenomena are first making themselves felt. I think the second ex uh, imperative has to do with incentives and what conversations are you incentivizing in the organization, which are you not? So my poster child at the moment would be the dramatic reversal of fortunes of Kraft Heinz. Um, and you know, Kraft Heinz was bought by 3G. They're very famous for their zero-based budgeting, cost-cutting philosophy. But what I think happened in that case was there was just such an emphasis on just reduce cost, reduce cost, reduce costs, just do as much as you can with, with as limited resources as you can. There was almost no resource left for experimentation or playfulness or reinventing the brands or anything. And what ended up happening was um, there was a recent glass door survey done of their own employees. Uh, and under a third of them said that they would recommend to their friends or family that they work for Kraft Heinz. And so to me, that's just a recipe for inward looking, being paranoid, not being able to face honest news about what's going on in your business. And ultimately, you know, it shows up in the numbers down the road. Hmm. Uh, thank you. And Rita, one, one last question. Uh, you've, you've, you've been working on the software um, part of Valais now for, for, for some time. What are some of the learnings and maybe adjustments that you've been doing as you proceeded with, with the team that you have? We're on about Belize, you know, 5.0 at this point. Um, well, we started off um, very simply just saying, look, let's, let's just get onto paper and instructions, what people can do. Um, and we found that wasn't really getting much uptick. And then we thought, well, why don't we use the tools in conjunction with consulting? And as, as Scott and others have found, um, that just has a limited amount of reach. Um, so where we are right now is trying to figure out a way that the platform will actually do certain functions that we teach. Um, so rather than you having to take a piece of paper and come up with whatever it is you're coming up with, this software would actually lead you step by step through the, the actual process. So we're hoping that will be uh, fruitful. It's not really ready for prime time yet, but um, we're, we're thinking that'll be a better approach. No, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to version nine, nine, one, maybe. Nine, two. <laughs> it's just, it's been quite the journey. No, I, I mean, I, as Scott can tell you, you know, when you try to combine the, the intelligence of consulting with any kind of, you know, pre-programmed 
the software tool, it's, it's harder than you think. <laughs> I would 100%, 100% agree with that. It, it, this stuff is not easy. And, you know, we're going to keep trying, but, you know, we're arguably on version. If you go back to the foundation of Insight, we're at least version 4.0. So we're one version behind you, Rita, but we're coming <laughs> on fast. <laughs> But well, I'm just wondering what you guys think about this, because I actually think that the work you're doing is so fundamentally important and the work that we're doing is so fundamentally important. You know, you can walk into an organization, teach them how to see around corners and make different investment decisions. And then when they go and sit on their desk, they open the whatever platform they're using right now to ask for resources. And they have to make five year projections like the tool, like tools are based on a point of view about how the world works. And then, and then and that point of view becomes the expression in the tool. And when people use that tool, they act as if that's their point of view as well. And so I think it's really important that we, we develop tools that are a manifestation of the points of views that we're trying to teach people. So, yeah. I think that's, a, that's an excellent point. Uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna open up for the questions. And, and the way uh, I, I think we'll, uh, we'll do this is, um, Tanai and Scott and Rita, if you're able to see this, the Q and A's, we're, we're just going to start, stop on the, start on the top where we have the most uh, likes and we'll work our way down. <clears throat> um, so the first question we have here is from Ninja. Uh, have any of the panelists tried solution at an ecosystem level with their platform tools before? Do you share experiences and lessons learned? Uh, any of you want to have a, have a go at that? I don't understand the question. That's my problem. I'm stumped by the question. Well, I, I can I can uh, give it a jab uh, from my understanding, and then uh, uh, Ningjia, if uh, if we misunderstand your, your question, just uh, just uh, elaborate. <clears throat> so, a lot of the tools that we've been prioritizing for us are uh, built for the innovation superclusters, and and actually the very first pilot customers that we customer that we have uh, got his hands on the platform and effectively wanted to make it a completely global open innovation platform from day zero. Uh, and we were a little bit hesitant because we're still in beta. We have no idea what's going to happen if we have like, uh, you know, even a hundred or, or even a thousand users on it. Uh, but I think that some of the platforms that at least, or some of the platform tools that, that we have and, and probably also the others um, are fully functional at an ecosystem level where you can open it up to a large number of people, both inside and also outside. Uh, the uh, the organization. So I'm not sure if that fully answered your um, your question. Yeah. So let me let me rephrase this question uh, and, and read up Scott uh, and Tendai. So the question is really um, the platforms that you're working on. How adaptable are they to go beyond any single organization? So so can a user, let's just say within Ford, easily open up and invite people from outside that environment? Uh, I'll just answer conceptually. There, there's no conceptual reason why someone couldn't. And, and I think in as much as you believe that collaboration is a key to cracking tough problems, which I think we all would agree that it is, that would make a lot of sense. We haven't yet done that. So the, we don't have a, a practical answer to that or a use case, but I, I certainly could imagine the tool being used in that sort of way. And it could be then very powerful because you then get these diverse perspectives coming together that lead to an answer that no one would have come up with on their own and also gets an ecosystem to begin to think we got to move in that direction, not that direction to solve the problem. Yeah, that, and, and that's really interesting. And, and, and I think, Scott, you're already starting to show that with some of the work that you're doing with the sprints, right, where you connect people that are not necessarily with the boutique consulting and people that are not necessarily part of your company to help companies and, and, and startups and, and, and teams solve, solve problems. So conceptually, even a strategizer that we do this, we have coaches, you know, log on because it's a platform. So anybody can kind of join in the conversation and we can support each other to, to sort of help each other make decisions. So, so in a sense, there's it's already an, 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 an expression of that approach to work where you can open up platform to various players. And, and actually, the, the next tool that we're publishing um, on the platform is called a Supercluster Open Innovation Map. And it's designed for hundreds of people within one innovation cluster to go online and basically input industry-level challenges and then having the option of, of voting it up or down so on, on an ecosystem level, they can basically crowdsource what are the problems and challenges this cluster is going to work on. Um, so that's, that's next, next in line. Uh, Rita, I'm gonna give you the next question here. 
And the question is again from uh, Ningya, and how do you decide which arena to play in? Oh, um, well, I think um, there's actually a really good book on this um, by my colleague, Mark Gruber, and one of his colleagues called Where to Play, uh, which is, you know, very visual, very engaging. And I think that's, that's a good place to start. Um, when I talk about arenas, I think what's really clear is, what's really important is to be clear on what you're competing for. So a great example of this is Netflix, and their CEO has been very public about saying, we're competing for your disposable time. So anything, bubble bath, glass of wine, other video content, of course, uh, but anything you could be spending your spare time on, we want a piece of that, and we want as much of it as we can possibly get. And that's a real arena statement of competitive scope, right? So he's basically said, you know, we're not just thinking of ourselves as competing against television. We're competing against anything you could be spending your time on. And that's a real arena way of framing. And when you frame it that way, and it comes back to, um, you know, Clay's observation about jobs to be done, right? When you frame it that way, you're saying, well, okay, what job is it I want to be doing better than anybody else um, in, in any kind of space? And what's the resource that I'm competing for? Mm -hmm. And I think once you start asking those questions, it really opens your mind to a very different way of thinking about, you know, who your competition really is. So in the book, I use the example of the apparel business. Yeah. And um, when you think about apparel, especially clothing for, say, teenagers, um, you know, what, what are they doing with clothing? What's the job clothing does for them? Well, if you think about it, if you're a teenager, clothing has an enormously important communicative and sort of status job to do. It, it tells you who you are, who you're not, what tribe you're part of, what tribe you're not. And if you think about teens and clothing, right, they're also on their devices all the time. So they're sending pictures to each other. So what you want is you want clothing that's different every time. You know, all you need is clothing that lasts for 10 minutes to get the perfect selfie and then you move on. And if you sort of follow that to its logical conclusion, what you see is the rise of fast fashion as a trend in apparel, which parallels almost exactly the rise of adoption of this kind of communicative technology. Um, and so, you know, if you're thinking about your arena as, as the money teens are spending on communicative devices or communicative technologies, clothing and technology are both part of that arena. And you need to understand the relationship between them to know where your competitive moves should be made. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, Scott, I'm going to give, give you the next uh, question here. It's from, uh, from Frederick Madsen. And the question is, how do you think AI can support strategy platforms? Uh, I, I know you, you touched on that briefly uh, previously, but do you want to you shed some more light on AI for strategy platforms? Yeah, well, I, I think it actually ties very nicely into Frederick's next question, which is new need for organizations to monitor trends to be able to see around corners. Is I, I think that's one of the key places where AI can provide a lot of potential value. Where as we begin to have these communities forming that are looking at change in their respective industries, that essentially you can get a distributed monitoring system where each of them can use AI to be able to spot some of the things happening at the edges of respective industries, and then have something that self-learns to be able to say, okay, this is one of those. This is one that we really have to watch. Because right now, we still have checklists and guides and principles, and Rita had eight tips in seeing around corners, which are great eight tips. But the more that these eight tips about spotting the peripheral changes, the more it gets fed with real experience from really diverse settings, countries, industries, and so on, the better those early warning systems will be. So that's just one instantiation of something where I think good use of artificial intelligence, big data analytics, and so on, can take something that right now is at the level of heuristics and over time make it something that is much more predictive and much more powerful. This obviously doesn't happen tomorrow, but this is the sort of stuff that I think you can imagine happening in the next generation or so. Again, lots of changes for consultants, for strategy, and for the essence of business itself as this plays out. Thank you, thank you. I'll take the, uh, the next question from Steve, and then tonight afterwards, I'll give you the question from, uh, from David. Um, so <clears throat> Steve is asking about sort of the, the evolution of ecosystems from a localized uh, center of power to a more geographically distributed uh, biotechnology. And I think, Steve, the question is, is uh, you know, the four perspectives that we hear here, uh, how, how they should be integrated or, or, or work together. And I think if I go back to the conversation that, that me and, and Rita and, and Asher of, of InnoZX had, 
back in December. I think this webinar and this conversation right now is, is really a, um, exploring what, what's happening in the field, exploring what everybody else is doing and, and thinking, and really trying to bounce some ideas and, and at least for our part, soak up as much learning as we can in trying to understand this field, um, what's happening, where is it headed, and what are some of the emerging practices that we, we see. And who knows, we'll, um, we'll definitely keep this, this dialogue and this topic going because this, this big trend that we open with Scott in terms of the platform economy and strategy is, is absolutely converging, but on a long horizon. Um, then I, I'll give you can I jump in there? Um, I, I recently was in London giving the Penrose lectures, very, very prestigious at the uh, at SOAS, which is a part of the University of London. Um, and one of the talks was how digital technologies in particular have changed our theories of the extent to which you can have administrative control. Um, and what Edith Penrose, who is the person this lecture was donated, nominated in honor of, um, she basically posited that a limit to growth was the uh, extent to which there was administrative control by human beings. And one of the arguments I would say is taking her theory forward, we now have an administrative control that can be exercised by heuristics, by algorithms, by, um, you know, basically by computer code. So if you look at the, an example would be the way the uh, online advertising system works, that matching keywords to ads shown to a particular person, say on a search engine, there's no human being in that whatsoever once the thing is set up. So the human beings sort of say, okay, this keyword is worth X, Y, Z to me, but then the algorithm takes it from there. And so what I I think you, you're seeing is a greater ability to govern ecosystems than we ever had before, and also a real change in the limits to growth that historically we've posited. So I think we're really seeing some very rapid advances in the kind of coordination we can have with an ecosystem model. Fabulous. Thank you. Mm -hmm. and then uh, going back to, uh, to Dave's question and, and uh, you tonight, uh, what are the biggest barriers to adaptation that we see? So, so what's interesting about this? <laughs> so what's interesting about this is I actually think that the you know the, the technology is there, or if not almost there. So so the barrier is not that the stuff doesn't work, right? No, not anymore, at, at, at least. I think the barrier that I see, and uh, and I've had several conversations about this with Alex as well, is that you know the return on investment is is a, is on a longer horizon. So what you really need is a, is a certain type of leadership, right? Leadership that can balance running the core business and thinking about the future. Because if I can go into a company and say, listen, I've got this piece of software. I can save you $2 million in three months by making this thing go faster. The return is completely right, right there and then. But if we say, let's like build a platform for see, seeing around corners, start running experiments and testing which ideas work and which ideas don't work. And then maybe in like, you know, five year horizon, you'll see like a new growth business model emerging from your organization. That's a harder conversation to have. You need a certain type of leadership to kind of get into that. So I think that's one of the bigger barriers that, you know, that, that we have. And, and it, yeah, it takes a while to get over something like that. But, you know, we are succeeding, you know, slowly. If I think I just one of the best comments on this was um, Jeff Bezos was basically chewing out an analyst who congratulated him on having a great quarter and Bezos laced into him and he said, you know, that is just such a stupid observation to make, which is the, the ground of this quarter were, were the plant, the, this quarter was, was designed three years ago. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. I interrupted you, Scott, sorry. Yeah, no, no problem. I was just, the, the other thing I was gonna add to this, the barrier to adoption, the, the reality is we're still in the consultative sales process for these things. And I'll tell you, selling a, a $3 million strategy project and a $3,000 tool project or $30,000 sprint project or whatever, it, it's the same process and it's just as hard. And just consultative sales takes time and you've got to build trust and all that. We will reach a point where it becomes something that is really more like a software purchase. And I know some of the things that you've heard today, they're closer to that level and you can have sales like that. But you know, the more complex you make it, the more it feels consultative and the more you gotta get the stakeholders aligned and all that. And that just is time and effort. And it is a business model issue too. Yeah. That's a, that, that's a really a key, uh, key observation, Scott. Um, and I will read up. What are your thoughts on, on that, uh, that dimensions? Which, the, the, uh, the, 
the, the sales? I mean, effectively, how, how does companies, big or small, get onboarded? You know, does it require a, a human touch or, or can it be fully automated? If it's really strategy that they're looking for, I think there's always going to need to be a human touch because, you know, effectively what you're looking for is leading indicators about the future. And by definition, those are qualitative. Reasonable people can disagree. So, you know, the tool can spit out an answer. I mean, you could do that with Excel, right? Um, so I think anything that really gets in the guts of your strategy process is probably going to forever be a human to human thing. Now, are there pieces of it that you could turn into a utility like an Excel or a Word or a PowerPoint? Yes, I think there are. Uh, but to make meaning from it, that that's a human thing. So it's one thing to be able to provide PowerPoint as a, as a tool. You know, what the PowerPoint slide says is up to individual human beings. Yeah, but what's interesting, I mean, even what we're learning from a, from a, from our perspective is, and I completely agree with what you're saying, Richard, with the strategy, sometimes it requires that level of high touch. But, but even like, as Scott was saying, even like a $30,000 innovation sprint, like people, have, you still have to like to talk to people about it because people feel like you're, you're about to take the company off the cliff or something, which is something like that. So it's, it's sort of this creating this trust and, and sort of, you know, the, you know, the, the ability to uh, allow their teams to, to, to do this work. When people understand that innovation is not inconsequential for the organization overall. So is this, even if they plant a small seed, they kind of worry about what, what impact that's going to happen. So that's still a conversation to have. Yeah, yeah but tonight, I think I do think one of the things that strategizers done a great job of is taking some of those tools and business model canvas would be the obvious one um, and really making it so accessible that, you know, you, you, you can download it, you can get it, you can use it. And sure, it'd be better if an expert guided you through it, but you can make an awful lot of progress on your own. And I think that's one of the very cool things about the tools that you guys have developed. Yeah, absolutely. Tandai, I want to, I want to maybe give you the next question from anonymous, uh, <clears throat> it's really about uh, how can we use platforms as a live sandbox to test and learn before deploying in the real world, um, and and you know given the, what, what you guys are developing around the the testing environment, so what what are your thoughts on that? So, so it, it, it all, so anonymous is my favorite person. They 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 show up on every workshop that I'm doing, <laughs> but uh, the the. Uh, um, uh, so it's, it, it all depends on what this question means. So if you're a software company, for example, right, you could create a testing environment where you actually build software products and test them before you deploy them into the real world. So you can like sort of close, you know, like a closed beta, for example, and, and there's people that are building those sort of sandboxes and, and what platform, if you have a platform business model, that it, it sort of allows you to run, to run those tests. But if you're thinking about it from a business model perspective, right, you know, we're building a platform where you can sort of, you know, benchmark your business model, identify your assumptions, and start running tests to sort of, you know, test your, your riskiest assumptions, track progress in terms of, you know, how close are you to finding something that actually works. And so there's sort of two parts to that, but the, the testing, the platform is where you're tracking what you're testing, but the testing of the business model happens in the real world versus a platform in which you're actually building the, 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 the software product on the platform and then testing you know, as a, as a, as a, as a, as a sandbox. So there's sort of two things to that, to, to, to the question, both which are possible. Yeah. And, and Scott, I'm, a, you know, I'm aware of time. So I think we'll do a, a last question here. And I was thinking of giving it to you, to you, Scott. And the question from Steve Busey is really, um, how is the consultant's role changing uh, on the back of, of this shift that we're seeing? Uh, Steve, thank you very much for your question. Someday I will meet you in person. Steve has met with a couple of my colleagues in the U.S. and is just a, an avid, avid devourer of all things produced by everyone who is on this webinar and really helping to drive some big change in the Salvation Army. So, Steve, sorry for outing you, but uh, but there you go. I, I think you're absolutely right. You know, I, I, I have to call our organization a consulting organization because that's the closest to what we do. But when we're really at our best, we're a co-conspirator, we're a coach, we're a guide, we're an enabler. And I think when I hear consultant, you historically think this is this group that goes off in a room somewhere, does something in a black box and gives someone an answer. And that really has very little impact. So I think this idea that a consultant is really more of a facilitative role and the platform dramatically enhances their ability to facilitate 
I think is absolutely right. You know, sometimes you can only really understand it when you see it, you know, back to the question before, you know, how do you, how do you overcome some of these issues? You know, the ability to actually have people go and experience the platform, have the ability to go through a live demo or something like that. That's when people really see, my goodness, this is going to change the way I approach it in a very positive way, because it will be a guide, a shepherd, a coach that brings me along the journey. And this transforms the way that I think about this problem in this relationship. So I think absolutely right. And I think platforms will only accelerate the change. So we have, we have 12, uh, about 10 or 12 questions left. So what I suggest is that um, I'll, uh, I'll take the lead and I'll type up very brief answers. I'll put them in the back of the slides we sent out because I'm, I'm aware of everyone's time and I'd like to, to actually to go into the closing um, remarks. So, so Rita, uh, Scott Tendai, uh, if you want to do a very brief kind of concluding remarks from your side. So um, I'll start. Uh, I think what we're starting to see and the people on this call are a really good example of being able to say, you know, there's lots of solutions that clients need. And rather than seeing one another as competitors, wouldn't it be great if we could sort of say, well, Rita's really terrific at X and Strategizer's brilliant for Y and Inside is perfect for, you know, this other thing um, to come up with some more complete solutions. So I think in a way, platforms presage perhaps a shift in the way strategies, strategy consulting has traditionally been done. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't, I, 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 I couldn't agree more, I think. I think that the more we work together, the more we collaborate, the more we share the best practices and, 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 and ways of working, the more we're able to sort of move this boulder, right? You know, if we all lean into it, I think we'll be able to sort of, you know, make the shift that we're, 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 we're trying to uh, accomplish. I don't believe that this is one of those winner-take-all type platform markets. I think this is one of those where, you know, various, various people can be great at something and we can work together collaboratively. I would just pile on and agree with that, though, you know, one does wonder where we're kind of at that Cambrian explosion moment where you see so many of these platforms out there. Which one of us is the Ask Jeeves? Which one of us is the Alta Vista? And is there perhaps a, a Google in the bunch? And I think we all know in the early stages, if figuring out the business model is going to be the ultimate key to success. Okay. And I think you hear from all of us that the business model for this is really tricky. So I think the software is going to be worked out that's reasonably trivial, but figuring out a business model that scales impact is the thing that you hear us all saying, that's what we're really, really pushing on in the months and years to come. The exciting part is you can feel the change beginning to happen. And for our, our role at Insight, going back to our roots and being able to deliver against the original intent of the organization is a tremendously exciting thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think uh, tremendously exciting is, is a good way to summarize. And I, I was just looking um, uh, at, at the book from uh, Marquitas on, on game-changing strategies. And I just realized, you know, that the books about these conversations, they haven't really been written. Those, those platform economy books that I showed initially, uh, they don't really cover in, in any uh, very specific way this topic. So it'll be very interesting, Scott, to, to see your first article coming out of sort of the the story behind Innocent X, uh, taking us behind the scenes, if you will. And, and really, uh, maybe the big, uh, big takeaway from, uh, from uh, my part is, is this is a really a fascinating journey that we're on. Uh, and I think everyone and everyone who's on this call is, is really trying to learn. Uh, and as you said, figure out the growth model, figure out the business model, and figure out uh, the software mechanics as we develop this over time. So on, on that note, uh, I want to thank all of you, Rita, New York, Scott in Singapore, and Tanai in, uh, in Omaha, uh, and Chris based in, in Norway. So I really want to thank you for taking the time. I want to thank you for, for joining and uh, spending this uh, hour and a half with us today. And if you have any questions, if you have any comments, I'm sure that the speakers will be happy to do emails and, and Twitter messages as time allows. And uh, I look forward to, to see what happens next. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank, thank you very much. You. Bye. All right. Thank you all.